resiliency is such a popular topic. Um, how would actually you define resiliency? Absolutely. Uh, well, certainly the fact that I'm still standing here today tells you how important resiliency is after the past nine months. But really for me, it's being uh, determined, uh, being able to bounce back and bounce through a variety of obstacles. I think uh, a friend of mine once told me that in difficult times, you have to get through it to get to it. Uh, and so for us, you know, we've got to get through it and to get to it, we'll be able to conquer COVID and still be able to sustain our organization and make an impact in our community. So it, it's really a combination of things, but definitely got to be determined and we've got to be willing to kind of bounce through it and keep bouncing back. And it's not negative, right? No. I mean, resiliency is not negative. It's a positive thing. I think it's a positive thing. I think it's a must right now in particular for leaders that are trying to navigate this. You know, we, we have to be resilient. We have to believe we're going to get through it. Uh, and we have to look for every opportunity to do just that. So, you know, your organization in particular, um, I mean, a lot of nonprofits have been impacted by COVID, but I know you've had to do a lot of different things. But when you think of the Akron Area YMCA and other nonprofits, um, what do you think about most? And like, what concerns you about your future? And how are you re using this resiliency Ooh. mindset to, to, <laughs> right. to manage it, right? Right, right. Uh, definitely for us, you know, we are in the people business and we're in the business of serving other people. So really trying to determine how do we take care of our people uh, so that they can take care of others and continue to make the great impact. And I think one of the things that we realized a few months into COVID was that we really needed to revisit our strategic plan. Um, we really needed to have a vision of how we could potentially get through this and, and how do we need to revise that. And so basically we really focused on uh, recover, reimagine, and rebuild. And that has really helped guide us through uh, what we will look like as we come out on the other side of this. But, but definitely people is very important to us. And, and certainly the vision uh, that I would then be able to motivate and inspire our staff team that we can achieve this, that together we can achieve this. So, you know, you mentioned people, and then when we were doing our prep for this session, people were just, it, it was very central to everything that you talked about. and. I think many of us um, right now, you know, we don't get to see a lot of people, you know, we're mm -hmm. seeing each other on Zoom, we're seeing each other, you know, across the way, we're seeing each other with masks on, we're seeing each other and we don't know that we're seeing a person that we know. Um, but you, you talk so much about it, um, actually as much as your business model. So talk a little bit more about people with us and how, how that's impacting you. Sure. I think, you know, it's been very difficult for us. We have a very, wide range workforce as far as age goes. So anywhere from a 16 year old to an 80 year old potentially that's on staff. But when we went through the initial shutdown from COVID in March, by the first week of April, we'd laid off 50% of our staff. So, and many of you on this call, I'm sure are in the same situation. And that really was difficult for our staff to navigate that as now their friends and coworkers were no longer with us uh, or there to provide even support for them. So I think we really had to express our concern for the staff uh, we've been very intentional about that. We've been very intentional about uh, trying to provide support for our staff as we try to navigate this. And, and I know we can always do better, uh, but we've acknowledged that it's hard. You know, we have had to uh, remind ourselves that everyone goes through this in a different way. And, and we have to accept that, that some people are able to navigate this with more positivity than others. But how do we then lift those folks up that are really struggling? to get on path with the rest of us that we will get through this. You know, we may look a little different when we come out on the other side, but we will still need our people. That will be one of our most important assets. And we really need to continue to invest in them, even though, again, that has been really a challenge. Uh, but we're trying to adapt and we're always trying to learn and listen. And, you know, we're not always perfect at that, but trying to listen to our staff and what needs do they have? What could help them potentially navigate this and even help them be more resilient. Is there anything, have you done anything in particular that stands out to you that's been more successful than others? I mean, you mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of different things that you've tried and support. I mean, I'm just looking for maybe some examples that are. Sure, sure. I think a lot of it's really been uh, around some of our communication uh, with the staff, uh, trying to be as regular with those communications and as transparent as we can, but yet offering, again, the lemon to lemonade, you know, the lemonade, we're going to get through this, you know, we, we can sustain this, we can weather the storm, and we need you to be with us through that. I think we've done really intentional about thanking staff and appreciating them. So again, 
things that are so simple that we can all do so easily that don't cost anything but a little time, you know, a personal note uh, that, that's very much uh, appreciative of what they have actually done uh, for us. And uh, really, it's simple things. Uh, sometimes we can, you know, provide a cup of coffee, uh, make a visit. Uh, one of the things I agree with you when you mentioned about all this virtual format is that I'm normally out and about. I'm normally seen by our workforce. I'm, I'm out there supporting them. I'm listening to what's going well and what's not going so well. And certainly COVID has prevented a lot of that. And what I've tried to do is really build into my schedule a time where I can safely go to our branches and, and at least be seen. And I, 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 fortunately for me, I was able to do that yesterday. And it's not only uplifting, I believe, for the staff, but it's uplifting for me. It really reminds me of why it's so important that we're doing this work. And it's very important that we as leaders, you know, remain strong and remain determined that we'll get through this. So you talk about, you know, the people, um, but I think many of us uh, that are on this call have some sort of leadership role. Um, what does resiliency really mean to you personally and as a leader? Because that, right. that could mean two different things. Right. I think they do coexist. Um, obviously, I have to be very resilient as a leader, but in being resilient as a leader of our organization, I also have to take care of me because I'm only as good at, to my organization as I am personally feeling um, and how I'm taking care of myself. So, you know, I think I really had to remind myself to take care of me. And I think coming out of the gate, and again, I'm sure many have experienced this, the first three to five months even were just brutal uh, in our organization. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we were working 24 seven. One of the disadvantages of, of this technology and working from home is you never turn it off. I think mm -hmm. that probably many of us have experienced that. And I had to really realize that I wasn't setting a very good example for our staff team if I was on 24 uh, seven. And that I had to not only give myself permission to take a break and refuel, but I needed to give them permission to do the same. That it's okay to stop and say, hey, I, I need to take that break. You know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. But clearly, this is a marathon and it's going to be an ongoing one. So, you know, really being intentional about doing that for myself and even sharing that with staff. Um, I'm a runner, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm a trotter, I might say, actually. <laughs> Don't go all <laughs> fast, but I keep going. And I really try to share that with our staff. You know, just let them know what I'm doing. You know, I was out, it was snowing. I was out because it was raining, but I still did it and it had a sense of accomplishment and it, it refuels me. Um, and then, you know, some of them it lets them see me as a human you know, just my regular human nature. What does Jill look like on a crazy afternoon after a run in the rain? You know? <laughs> and I think that's really helped me and it's also helped our team as well. Well, I think that vulnerability kind of plays a part in it, right? Yeah, I mean, situations like this, people want to know that the people that are leading them have, that are, you're, they're human, as you mentioned. And I know for us, one of the things that I did, um, I actually made our people each take a week vacation in uh, mm -hmm. July. And I said, I, they're like, we have too much to do. And I said, I have too much to do. Well, we're everybody's taking a week vacation. And it gave us something to look forward to in a time where there wasn't really anything to look forward to, <laughs> you know? Um, but it is, you're right, the little things of just letting our people see us as, as real. Right. right. And I think you're right, though. You, you took the initiative to take some time off and gave them permission to do the same. And I think that, again, I began to realize that if I weren't, if I wasn't doing that, and again, I'm on call, I, I am a CEO, I understand I'm in charge all the time, but I, I needed to let them know that it was okay when you felt like you were meeting, you know, reaching the proverbial brick wall, take a breath, take a break, and the why and our challenges are still going to be here, uh, or our successes, you know, when you, when you return. So I think that was important um, from both sides, as a leader and for me personally. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing a lot of us are missing right now, and I see a lot of it in our clients where everybody is just on 24 seven and, and I'm starting to see a lot of burnout in people, right. um, which is going to affect uh, our organizations too as we start to come out of this, that's right. tough. I would agree. So, you know, you know, we talk as we start to come out of this, you know, you and I were talking before, um, you know, the webinar came on about how, you know, Dr. Fauci is talking about, you know, we're gonna start seeing maybe things opening up late spring, early summer, and that's very exciting, um, but it's still as, people say it's very hard to plan and we all want to have some sort of plan with, but with the unknown. Um, it does seem difficult, um, though nobody ever knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but it seems more difficult now. How are, how are you approaching planning right now? You mentioned, you know, going back to your strategic plan was one of those things. 
Right. And I, and again, I think when you and I talked previously, uh, briefly that I mentioned, I didn't want to go back to the strategic plan. I, I figured that that was blown up and could be probably shredded and thrown out. Uh, but it was a really good exercise for us to pull that out and revisit where we are and where we were going. And we were pleasantly surprised in some things that we were still on task. We were still uh, aiming towards those goals and, and actually believe it may take longer, but that we would be able to initiate some of the things that we had been thinking about two and three years ago, potentially. Uh, but we also recognized there, there were changes that we need to make. And there are some things that now became much more urgent than what they had been at the time we had done that. And, and that's where I, when I mentioned earlier about recover, reimagine and rebuild, that really became the focus of our strategic plan as we launch into 2021. And everything that we're doing to plan for next year, we're keeping that in mind. And, and one of the things that we're doing, you, you're absolutely right. We all wish we had the crystal ball. Boy, what I would have given for one of those um, <laughs> nine months ago. But you know, the pivot is the word of the year. And, and we've learned about ourselves some positive things as we looked at our strategic plan. I can self-reflect and tell you that our, our organization was probably like a slow moving barge um, until COVID hit. And we have learned to adapt and change direction very rapidly based on what's going on around us and the needs of our community. Uh, and that's been rewarding when we took a look at that and went, wow, look what we've done in this past nine months. So again, looking at that strategic plan, we do a regular update with our board on our strategic plan, generally uh, no less than quarterly. Uh, obviously we had missed uh, June in the nature of COVID, but we came back to that in September and we do a report card that we provide just as an update on where we are. And again, it was a, it was a good exercise for us. So I would encourage you, if you haven't done that, that you might wanna take a look at that. And it may be a time to revise certainly, and, and absolutely we all have some revisions, but it also may give you an opportunity to say, wow, you know, things aren't as bad as I maybe thought they were. You know, we do still have some things that we are able to do that are really making impact. One of the things we also learned is that, you know, we, we're fortunate, we have a diverse organization as far as our funding streams go. So when we looked at our strategic plan from the funding side, you know, it was helpful that we, though really struggling in one area, uh, in another area, we've been able to, again, adapt and pivot what we were able to offer to fill gaps in the community and it was helping us be sustainable. So it, it, again, a very good exercise. Again, if you haven't done that, uh, I, I do encourage it because I was surprised and I was kind of kicking and screaming, I might say that I, I just <laughs> didn't even want to pull it out. Uh, but again, once we actually did pull it out and it, I think it even helped our staff teams, uh, we were able to put that back in front of our staff and say, you know, wow, look how far we've come and what we've been able to weather and, and how positive things do look in these certain areas as we look forward to you know, 2021 and beyond. So I, have I have two questions actually about strategic planning. I mean, you have certain people who may, and I don't know where you were in your strategic planning, in your strategic plan, were you toward the beginning of it? Were you toward the end? Were you smack dab in the middle? And I would imagine there's some people who may, may have been planning on going into strategic planning process this year. There were, some organizations who may be in the same situation as you and some that were at the end are thinking about, about going forward. What are some things that you maybe thought about differently after you stopped kicking and screaming about the plan that, um, that, that you found the most helpful? All right. Uh, well, we were right in the middle uh, really of the plan, the three-year plan. We generally do kind of real-time strategic planning. So we do try to visit it once a year in, revised slightly just based on what's going on around us. Uh, so I think that, that that helps us in that we're not locked into that whole three years and feel like we can't revise based on what's going on around us. So, you know, we're able to take into account that COVID has changed our business model. It has impacted us in a way we never expected from, you know, how we navigate through revenue and expenses uh, to, to simple operational decisions about what we, what we can and cannot do. Uh, but I think that the process of looking at it and every place there was a wall uh, within the strategic plan, we, we were then challenged to say, how do we get around it over or through it? So it actually then led to new ideas, uh, new creative ways of doing things, which I think was really helpful for us to get out of our own way. I think probably all of us could say from time to time, we get caught in our own box and by really taking a look at that, we were able to say, wait a minute, we do have creative people. We do have 
ideas of new ways of doing things that can help us navigate this. And we can infuse those into our strategic plan very successfully. And, and again, our board and volunteers were so supportive of that process as well. Um, and, and you know, due to COVID, they're not as uh, they're not able to be in our branches. They're not out there visiting us uh, boots yeah. on the ground. And so we're having to share these stories and share with them as we're reporting about the strategic plan, though we couldn't accomplish this, look what we were able to accomplish because we were able to adapt uh, and move in a different direction. So, you know, you mentioned people again, it keeps coming back to people. <laughs> yes, sorry. It does, but that's doesn't. awesome. You know, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you incorporate your, your staff team into the planning? Because I know that um, different organizations have different ways of doing things. Um, and especially now when, you know, you mentioned that you had to lay off about half of your workforce, you have people who were probably grieving um, because they, their friends were no longer there and coworkers. Um, you know, how it's hard enough, I think, sometimes to incorporate your team in to put your staff team into planning. But again, in this kind of situation, that adds another layer onto it. What are some things that you did and how did you incorporate them into this? Sure. So in traditional times, we would have, you know, all staff meetings and we would bring people together to have conversations and, and really try to prioritize some of our focuses for the future. But in this time, obviously we were not able to do that, but communication was still key. And I, I think for any of us in any type of leadership, communication can be our greatest challenge and our greatest success, how we are able to effectively communicate and let our staff teams feel like they're part of the solution and included in the process. I certainly think there's a lot more buy-in when you're able to do that. So, you know, we really tried to update them on where we were. Um, and when we saw gaps that were identified in the community, we tried to engage them in that process of, you know, what's going on in our community and particularly during our shutdown. So from March to May, you know, what are the needs that the community is going to have coming out of this and what can we do to meet those needs? And our staff team did that. Uh, I mean, they came up with amazingly creative uh, programming ideas, uh, calling uh, our older adults that are in isolation. I mean, they just came up with things that were very meaningful and impactful and they took ownership for that. Um, and it led to, again, some new program ideas, uh, launched some things that we hadn't been able to launch for a number of years, uh, which was our uh, initiative that allows our wise to get outside of our four walls and move into communities. So I think, again, keeping them as part of the process as much as you can. Uh, again, I, I thought it was a little more challenging having to do this all virtually, but I do think it was important that we go through the process. And as with most things, some staff engaged more readily in it than others. Um, but overall, I think our staff team in general felt they were at least uh, apprised of the situation of where we are, and they felt like they were given an opportunity to be part of the process, which I think is as important as being part of it. Yeah, you also mentioned that you re reached out to a lot of other nonprofits in the community. Um, how, how did that work out for you? Because I know that, it's, I hate this sounds kind of cliche, but we are kind of all in this together, especially on the nonprofit, right. in the nonprofit space. Right. So I think at first, we probably didn't do enough of that, and I, I could probably be... Um, critical of, of our organization that we probably didn't do that right out of the gate because we were just, again, scrambling, uh, really quite frankly, to just keep the workforce that we did have, keep our doors open the best we could, uh, and transitioning to some of these program models that we had to do. But I think that um, it, it just, we finally realized that we needed to reach out to the other nonprofits to find out where are the gaps. And, and again, could we have done a better job to be more collaborative? I think we always can do a better job of that, absolutely. But I think as we were able to reach out to other nonprofits and even kind of share our story or where we were, or what we were able to provide, uh, might, it gave them some ideas on some ways potentially they could adapt and change some of their programming. But it also then uh, allowed us to be an advocate for the great work that we were doing and other nonprofits were doing within this community and then led ultimately to some support from community foundations um, and some of our funders, because now you know, we're all talking about our story and what we're doing and what we're bringing to the community and how we are filling these gaps. And I, and I think it led to opening many doors, um, which has really quite frankly, uh, probably saved us uh, towards this last quarter of the year. You know, I mean, I think from a, from a collaboration standpoint, I, I, I think, what we saw was that, you know, everybody was in crisis mode from March until 
maybe even the end of summer where it didn't start to feel like there was any kind of normalcy, even though a lot of kids were remote back in school until the kids actually went back to school and you felt like you're in a more routine. So, I mean, I would say, you know, to nonprofits who still feel like, oh gosh, maybe it's, is it too late for me to reach out and the others in the community? I would say absolutely not. I mean, I think that for, for anyone who's thinking of even doing something different or, or changing a business model or venturing into something else, this would be a great time for collaboration. And I think that's one of the things we did find. It was a good time to end things that we should have probably ended a long time ago. <laughs> and it was a great time to reboot new things that, again, we had struggled to get off the ground. So, again, I, I know that we'll look back on COVID with mixed feelings and, and mixed reactions, but there is definitely, as, as we've talked about here in our organization, silver linings in this. Uh, and again, some of those opportunities uh, that have presented themselves that we would not have been able to do are one of those. And you said you also did some great things with like staff meetings and, and stuff to kind of just bring some light to to them and keep them less serious. Right. We did. We really tried to focus on that when we met. Uh, we meet with our entire leadership staff team. It's about 70 individuals or so, um, at least quarterly, all of them. And there were other meetings throughout this time period, of course, that we had to add to try to keep those communications open. But just taking time to really uh, start with the bright spot. You know, everyone's going through the challenge of day to day. You mentioned homes, you know, people are homeschooling, they're trying to still go to work, mm -hmm. they're trying to, you know, someone's unemployed, they're trying to figure out a million different things. And, uh, but what we found was that by starting with a bright spot, we kind of set the tone for our meetings, and people love sharing them. And it, as we go through every meeting now, people are anticipating, they all know we're going to do, we're going to start every meeting like this, and we spend anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, depending on what people have. We ask them to try to keep it short, but we certainly want to listen. And, and that's been really helpful. And people then, the other kind of pay it forward thing that's come from that is they've now added it to their own staff team meetings. And mm -hmm. people are then reaching back out to those individuals and saying, hey, congratulations, or wow, thank you for sharing that. You know, I thought I was the only one uh, maybe that had experienced that. So it's it's been really helpful for us uh, across the board. We've added some fun. We have some fun little contests we do. We've done some uh, COVID songs, uh, COVID poems, uh, just little things to try to lighten the day. Again, I, I have to appreciate that for some of our staff team that this is a trauma, as, as you mentioned, and on so many fronts. And I don't wanna minimize the fact that this is really difficult but I also want to inspire and motivate them that we can get through it. They can get through it. And uh, together we are better. So, so we have tried to have fun and, and we've had some good laughs, <laughs> uh, you know, some, some definite good laughs through this. Well, I know we, we were baking a lot of bread for a while. I think like everybody at the beginning of, of COVID, we've kind of tailed off on that a little bit. And oh, I think, uh, sure. The discussion more now is of who's binge watching what. So, but I do think, um, but I do think ultimately too, um, you know, nonprofits as a whole don't celebrate enough. Oh, sure. Um, and I think that, you know, by doing, you know, giving people time to talk about their successes and the things that are going well or the things that are just kind of happening um, gives us, again, goes back to that permission to be human. Um, but also, you know, I think nonprofits in general just grind. It's, there's constant grinding, you know, okay, next thing, great, the event's done, raise money, next thing, next thing, right. next thing, next right. thing. And being able to take time out and just saying, wow, okay, we, we have done a lot of really good things here and we need to be able to acknowledge that and, and be able to appreciate and thank our coworkers too. Right, I and mean, we did fun exercises even around that lemons to lemonade where we had people create displays that were moving lemons to lemonade. Uh, and, and, we, and we shared those on screen then, people actually shared those. So I mean, we, again, we did try to, be as helpful and supportive as possible to let's look for the, again, the silver linings and the bright spots throughout this. Yeah. So that's all great, but um, it's exhausting, right? We talked right. a little bit about permission. Um, how do you, well, how are you keeping people from burning out? I think that's been really hard. And quite frankly, I think it's maybe been hard, harder more recently than it was right out of the gate. Again, I think it goes back to my comments about, you know, this, became the marathon, not the sprint. When it first occurred, you know, I think we had a shorter window on it in our minds than what has actually occurred. So I think that uh, I've had to really recognize that that is happening and, and how can we help those staff rebuild and refuel. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it, it, everyone's going to be 
choosing that as on their individual basis. So even learning more about our staff uh, and how they like to be communicated with or uh, like to have ideas given to them, uh, you know, and trying to make it more personal in that, you know, if you need to take time off, we want you to take time off. Uh, we all have that little something in our gut that tells us, you know, we're burning out. There, there's something there that happens and, and really helping them understand that, wow, you know, you never talk like that. And that's really unusual for you to respond in that way, you know, and, and, and those are kinds of things I try to watch for and then try to reach out to that person and say, hey, you know, that was really unusual. Um, maybe it's time, let's just take a break. You know, maybe you take a breather and that's okay. We did a uh, recently a 90 minute breather day. Uh, and during that day, everyone had to take 90 minutes and either go out for a walk or, uh, you know, whatever they like to do, go listen to music, uh, get outside, get a really go have something to eat, you know, so sitting at your desk, go have a cup of coffee, whatever that was to them, go call a family member. We wanted them to take that 90 minutes. You take 90 minutes today because we were recognizing that uh, and, you know, we didn't want them to have to use vacation or work. We don't want to worry about any of that. And it was just 90 minutes and it was really well received uh, that we uh, gave them permission to do that, but we, we, we want them to, we almost mandated it. We didn't mandate it, but we really, really wanted them to do that. And a number of staff did reach back to us and say, wow, thank you. That, that little 90 minutes, I didn't realize, you know, how much I needed that. And it was only 90 minutes, you know, but it, but it made a world of difference. Lead by example. Again, I think I had to learn that myself. Um, I am a worker by nature. I, I love to work. I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. So it's difficult for me to also really disconnect. So I had to really um, invoke my own rules that I was trying to part, you know, share with others on myself and, and let them know that you know, I'm able to do this, so you are too. Kind of back to your vacation. If you can take a vacation, I can too. And then just giving them hope. I, I think you know, one of my roles is to really help them be hopeful. And um, that, that really, I think, helps them navigate with some of that burnout that, you know, we are, it is going to get better, right? Our organization may not look the same when we come out of this, but certainly uh, we'll still sustain this and there'll be a uh, return to some element of normalcy for staff. Uh, and hopefully some staff will be coming back. Um, we've been very intentional about thanking staff. Uh, our board has even gotten involved in that where they're writing personal notes to some of our staff team. Oh, that's nice. And that's really been help, and they love that. Let me, I, gosh, I could write a million notes, but you get one from my board chair or someone on our board of trustees, mm -hmm. particularly you know our executive committee or finance committee, and I have staff that walk down the hall and say, "Look what I got." I mean, so uh, yes, so those kinds of things are are really meaningful, and I do think those help with the burnout. So, you know, you mentioned your board, um, and when we talked as we were preparing for today. I think one of the hardest things is a lot of nonprofit board members also are in high level positions in the organizations that they work at. And so, you know, not only are they having to make decisions in COVID about what's going on in their business, but, you know, you're also leaning on them to help guide you in making decisions for um, your organization. And so, you know, how did, how did you manage your board through all of this? it couldn't have been easy. It, it wasn't, but I, I will, I think one of the things that I have been somewhat successful with is learning how to communicate effectively with my board where it's not too much information, but it's not enough information. And it's not too frequent, but it's not, not frequent enough. I, I, I've been able to identify that balance with our current board. Now that could certainly change as your leadership changes, but uh, you know, when we were going through things like PPP, for instance, as an example, which was very uh, time sensitive and I needed their support right out of the gate for a very uh, succinct period of time and I need a lot of their attention. Uh, once that was over and we evaluated that and realized that we actually had to return the PPP funds, um, you know, we were able to then change back to a more uh, acceptable communication style. And I think mm -hmm. we've been able to navigate that well. So our I've been very fortunate that our board, particularly the committees, executive committee in particular, if I call on them, they know that they're needed. Um, I'm not just gonna call them for the heck of it. Uh, I, I have a reason and, and it's really important that they're on. We're very transparent. Uh, when we came out of this, uh, you know, we thought in 18 months we could be gone the first two months mm -hmm. then, you know? And so we had to have some really frank discussions and they were 
engaged in that. And I understand what you're saying. They have their own lives, personal and professionally, uh, but the why and our impact and work in the community meant enough to them that they really dedicated the time. And when we scheduled something and we said it was going to be 30 minutes or 45 minute touch base, that's what it was. We were very conscientious about that and understand and appreciate that their time is, is uh, under high demand as well. So but they were they were very helpful and they had certain things they were more concerned about than others. Um, so we learned real quick that they wanted to know, you know, how much cash do we have on hand? You know, and, <laughs> and how long are you really gonna make it if you keep burning it like this? And, you know, so we started changing our messaging to really answer those questions first and foremost, because that's what was very important to them. And some of the other things that maybe we were thinking about, you know, we didn't spend too much time on. Um, I also started a CEO report that I do monthly, which is just a one page recap of where we are. And it includes some of those items that were very important to them right out of the gate. And then fills in from there as to what we're doing uh, as far as new programming or navigating or other challenges. I mean, you know, like everyone else, we still have our other properties we have to take care of and buildings we have to take care of. So just trying to keep them up to date on some of those things as well. But that report has been very helpful to them and they've appreciated that very much. So if we don't have a call scheduled, they know that they can get that update and then reach back out. Um, but they've been very engaged through the virtual. I think you and I talked about that. Our, our board <laughs> attendance with virtual has been almost 100% um, versus you know, we probably were maybe 75% or so. Uh, and so I think even going forward, what we've learned is we'll do some type of hybrid uh, for future meetings. Some, hopefully we can get back to in-person to some extent, but we'll definitely still use, um, you know, the virtual meeting format for some of our meetings. And, and I think they've appreciated that very much. You know, you made a point about, um, you know, you have buildings to run and you have all these other things that you need to do. And um, I think that goes to, you know, you, you need to use your board. You can't spend a ton of time managing your board, but you need to use them when you need them and manage them in a way that is helpful, right? You, you don't want them being too much involved in the minutia because that's right. not where they serve you best, right? No, it's not. No. Yeah, really. And, you know, I think I really needed them to be in an advisory capacity, you know, based on their experiences. Um, here's how their recommendation or advisory. So we really uh, have a, a very fortunate, our board stays out of operations. They hired me for operations and, and that's what I do. And, you know, they expect me to certainly uh, report on where we are and things, but they don't expect to have to get involved in that. Um, but they do want to have the opportunity to advise on different decisions. PPP was a good example of mm -hmm. them, you know, advising and working through a process and ultimately coming to a decision that uh, was unfortunate in the end, but was the right decision at the time. Yeah. So, you know, continuing on with the people theme, um, you know, there's, there's other people we have our, we have our donors and, you know, I know that's been really kind of a wild card for a lot of organizations. Um, and I think for donors as well, because when COVID hit in March, a lot of, I think a lot of people were like, Oh, I really am kind of cautious about what I want to do with my money. I may support things that are very emergent. You know, you think of those, right. those agencies are very emergent. Other people right. like, I think I'm going to hold on to what I have because I don't know how the market's going to go, you know, away. Am I not going to have a job? So how, how did you, you know, work with your donors and how did they um, expect almost for you to interact sure. with them too? So I, I would say that for us, donors have been a bright spot that definitely our donors uh, were engaged in what we were up against, that they were wanting to hear our story and they wanted to hear our, our message and our message had changed. Uh, some of the things that some of them were very interested in were not a focus because of COVID and yet they wanted to learn a little bit more about, well, okay, you have reimagined this particular thing and you have a new focus and how is that impacting the community? And I think that we made some intentional efforts as well to reach out to our donors and try to keep them current. We try to reach out to donors at least six times in the year and we didn't change that. Uh, but again, our messages did change through this time period. And we've also really uh, committed to calling our top 200 donors, uh, making a personal phone call. And basically we were really trying to do that between December 1st and the end of the year. And we've uh, spread that between myself and some of our key leadership and even some of our board members have been willing to help with that. 
And again, just uh, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, you know, we are pivoting, we are sustainable, uh, reassuring them that the why will still be here. Though, as I've mentioned, we may look different, that uh, we will still be here and we still have needs, probably even greater than we had this time, absolutely greater than we had this time last year. And we've quite frankly had donors that, as you mentioned, we're in a, um, a more positive financial position that have given more this year, that have actually stepped up and given more. Uh, same thing with the, the foundation support and our um, the county and the state and things like that. And you know, just being having your donors even help be advocates for you uh, within the different legislative groups is really important. And that has been very helpful to us uh, throughout this. And again, you never know who someone knows until you start asking. And then we were able to find some connections that, that were very beneficial um, from some of our donors even that were able to take on a, a more meaningful role even for us maybe during this, this difficult time. So it's, it's forced us to get outside of our comfort zone to some extent um, and do things a little differently than we've done in the past. I, I would say that we, again, did do some changing to our messaging. Uh, again, we have changed some of our program focuses and Therefore, some of our donors that were very passionate about one particular program, and we can't offer that right now, quite frankly, um, have had to you know, decide, are, are they still okay with where we're going? And fortunately for us, they've been okay with that. They're, they've been okay with the change in direction. They, they've understood that change in direction, and they've appreciated that we have told them that up front. Mm. You know, um, we cannot do this program, here's why, but here is what we are doing, and we hope that you all uh, continue to invest in us and this new program initiative. You know, I think that's a really, really good point that it, it's, it's important to hammer home as you're thinking about, you know, being resilient. It's, it's that transparency of what you're doing, and even the transparency of what you're not doing, and, and why. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because... I think it shows that you know, you're making decisions based upon the long-term sustainability and viability of the organization, as opposed to doing something because that's the way it's always been. Absolutely. Um, and when you talk about you know, pivot being the word of the year, I would not be shocked. Um, there's all sorts of words. I'll be interested in what the word of the year is going to be this year. Um, but you know, I think organizations who have looked at COVID as an opportunity or looked at opportunities that have presented themselves during COVID are the ones that are gonna see the most resiliency coming out of this. Wouldn't you think? I, I would agree. I, I think it goes back to that, you know, if, if you've been willing to bounce and adapt uh, and that's so important with res resiliency and be determined, I think you're taking advantage of the opportunities uh, seeking out opportunities to fill gaps in the community and you have a better chance, I think, of certainly being successful. Well, we talk about here at .org, like if we, if you would have told us a year ago that we were going to be doing a webinar series and having a YouTube channel, I would have told you we were, you were crazy. Right. Um, but, you know, we took that opportunity and to try to try to be able to help others and, and look at ways that fit within our, our way of doing things, but just doing them a little differently. So, right. um, you know, I think that, I think the donor, I do have a question though around, um, around donors, because I thought this was a really interesting point that you brought up. The, you know, you said donors stepped up in ways that you didn't expect. Are you, have you found with any of your donors have almost been looking for additional ways to help you because they almost feel help, I don't want to say helpless, it's, a, it's not, the, you know, kind of know where I'm going with that, that they feel like they want to do something, they just don't know what. Right, right. I, I think we have seen that particularly at the branch levels where, again, for us, um, we have a lot of closures and a lot of uh, changes. So donors that were heavily involved with a specific location and potentially couldn't go to that location or be involved in that location uh, have really had to be educated on much more about our organization. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, a lot of times we get into silos and I think that some of our donors get in those silos as well. So mm -hmm. they just think this is the only place that you know, I know and I wanna make an investment and really trying to help them see a bigger picture about the net we can cast um, and with their continued support and help them navigate that process has been, has been interesting. And I do think we've had some folks that have fallen in kind of in that, that category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So before we get some final advice from you, um, we do have one question in the chat. And then also, um, we're going to be wrapping up here. So if you do have questions, put them in the chat. But um, 
We have a question. Um, have your staff inspired methods of resilience that you've implemented at the Y? Uh, actually, we have a great example. We have a staff team that um, it's a younger group of our staff. They're probably maybe if they're in their 30s. And they saw a need at their particular location for an increase in scholarships. They, they absolutely saw this. And, you know, at the time, who wants to ask anyone for, for money, at least in the branches that half the time were closed. Uh, and they took it upon themselves and they were determined that they were going to reach a goal that they had in mind. They had set for themselves at that particular location. And they were going to go about raising money um, to make sure that these folks that have now lost their jobs or unemployed could maintain their connection with their organization. And they did their own videos. Uh, they they did their own messaging and they started it within their um, their home location and then basically uh, it went very very well and very successfully and again it was driven by them and then they were able to share it out to the rest of our, our movement and others then were able to adopt it so they were incredibly resilient and determined uh, to do this and to make an impact. And where a lot of our staff were kind of like, how, how do you ask people for money when they just lost their jobs? And they had all sorts of excuses, uh, kind of back to our, the donor's idea. Uh, they just said, no, um, we believe there are still people out there that are gonna want to do this and we're gonna make it happen. And it's gonna make a difference uh, for what we're able to provide in our community. And they did, and, and they were so resilient. And they, even when they had their no, you know, the people that said no, uh, they <laughs> kept working it and they, they just didn't give up. So it was, it was actually refreshing and, and quite rewarding even for me to watch that. Cause again, those are our, our future leaders and I'm certainly always proud of their efforts and, and their own resiliency. To That's amazing. Do. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It's awesome. All right. We have another question. So, um, how, I, I mean, obviously we've talked about, you know, your strategic plan. Um, we, you know, a lot of organizations are at the point where they're planning for 2021. So how, how far into 2021? Well, first of all, where are you in your planning process for 2021 and how far into 2021 did you plan? So we went all the way through 2021. Uh, we did both our uh, strategic plan takes us through that into 2022. We also did our, our budget for 2021 full year, uh, and it was a difficult process, but we were really committed to seeing ourselves out of this. Um, and, and we know we may have to adjust, our, our board understands we might have to adjust, but we have uh, the scenarios of the what ifs, and if this, then that. So we have our contingencies in place, but we're looking out probably even now into uh, three to five years out is we start really trying to figure out again, back to you know, recover, reimagine and rebuild. We know it's going to take us probably three to five years to rebuild. Uh, and, it, and it may be with different focuses, uh, but we understand that it's gonna take time, but we have to be thinking about it. Um, you know, To see it ending in 2021 and what we're gonna look like, that wasn't sufficient. We were uh, really committed to going through 2021 with a confirmed uh, budget and plan with contingencies and then what do we look like beyond that? We're already looking out three to five years. That's interesting. I mean, I think we all probably need to get to that point where we're always doing every plan with contingencies, mm -hmm. right? It's not just in a, a pandemic, but it's saying, hey, okay, you, anytime you're making a plan, it's with the best information that you have at the time. Correct. Um, recognizing that it, that it could go anyway. So maybe, maybe the pandemic is going to teach us a little bit about planning differently right. in the future. Well, I think we don't, we always want, I think, human nature, we like to feel more optimistic. We don't like to look at the uh, what if doomsday type of events occur and what does that actually mean to our, our businesses. But again, if we want to remain resilient and sustain this, uh, we have to look at it from, from all perspectives. And as leaders, you know, there are going to be difficult decisions that potentially have to be made. And that's going to allow you to uh, continue to save your organization and, and make an impact in the communities you all serve. Absolutely. So do you have any final advice as we wrap up um, today for running a resilient nonprofit organization? Sure. Uh, so again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to everybody that's on the call today. But certainly for me, uh, the word courage, uh, early on in my leadership, I was advised to have kind of a, a leadership word that defined me and how I lead. And my word was courage. And it has been with me for eons now, it seems like, but it's not just the word. 
uh, courage that's important to me. It's what each letter for that word means to me and, and how I apply that. And so for me, uh, courage, the C is being competent. I, I think as leaders, we have to remain competent even when uh, the storms are brewing and uh, blowing directly into our faces. We still have to remain confident that we can get through this. We have to be optimistic. And I know I've heard mixed things on optimism right now when people are just feeling so deflated. But you know, if, if I don't feel optimistic about it, why would anyone be willing to continue to follow me through this storm? So I think being optimistic is critical. I think I need to be understanding. We talked a little bit, actually quite a bit, probably about staff and people. But I have to understand that everyone comes from a different place and is in a different place. And I have to be willing to accept that people are going to navigate through this uh, on an individual basis. And how could I be understanding of their particular situation and willing to learn about that? I think I need to be a raving fan. We talked about that. Even now, there are people that I'm a raving fan of, and I have been throughout this. And I need to take time to acknowledge that uh, and, and let them know that I'm rooting for them. And we're going to get through this together. Uh, being grounded, we talked about taking care of ourselves and giving our leaders permission to take care of each other or themselves. And I think that's really important, whatever that is for you, for spirit, mind, and body, that you're able to uh, remain grounded. And then do all things with excellence. E is for excellence. Uh, you know, if we're going to do it, and we've decided this is a great new direction, let's make sure that we do it with excellence in mind. So courage is definitely uh, one, one piece of advice uh, to everyone on this call. Well, Jill, thank you so much for spending time with us today. This has been, I'm, I'm, as I told you on our prep call, I could talk to you forever about um, you know, leadership and resiliency because I just think you have such a great handle on it. And I, I can see your why your organization is so successful. Um, and I wish you the best um, for 2021 and beyond. So thank, thank you. you very thank much you for being with us. Thank you everyone on the call. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. So as we um, as we wrap up today, um, I just want to, um, if you're interested in reaching out to Jill, um, you could reach her at jillk at akronymca.org if you have any additional questions that you think about after the webinar is over. Um, or you can reach me at amy at .orgsolutions.com. Um, we're both uh, more than happy to you know, answer any questions that you may have or clarify anything along the way. Um, also, too, I just wanted to um, let you know we do have some upcoming webinars that you might be interested in for the first quarter of 2021. Um, we'll be putting information out to you on these, but um, really our first quarter is about strategy and planning. So um, if that's something that you want to continue this conversation uh, about strategy and planning going forward, um, we do have a, a webinar that's going to be about setting your organization up for success. It's going to be led by our .org team uh, in January. Um, we're going to have a session. We're still working this one out, but it's going to be about the, the relationship of the development office and the business office, because I know um, that when those two work really well together, um, there's such an effective um, synergy that happens. Um, and so that's going to be more around probably the accounting and reporting side of things, um, which is... I, which I know is something that we always had a lot of people that come to us about a frustration, both on the business office side and the fundraising side. And then we're going to talk um, in March about integrating your fundraising and marketing plans because both of those should be intertwined. So, um, and then if you're interested in doing any past webinars, we do have them recorded. Um, uh, you can go to our website at .orgsolutions.com slash learning, um, or you can also visit our YouTube channel and, um, you can go and look at some of the past videos and webinars there. So again, thank you everyone for being here. And Jill, thank you again for being here. We're, we're grateful that you joined us today. And um, after this webinar closes today, there will be um, a uh, survey, quick survey link. We'd love to have your comments on what you liked about today and any ideas that you might have for future topics. So. Um, from our team to yours, um, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, uh, Kwanzaa, Festivus, anything that you do, celebrate, um, and best wishes to you for uh, a healthy and happy holiday season and successful 21. Thank you.